Hi guys, how are you? Hello, how's everyone doing today and welcome. Um, did you catch last week's video where I was talking about um, mood swings and the three main reasons that you might be experiencing mood swings prior to your period? We talked about thyroid and blood sugar and serotonin. So if that's of interest to you, you can check out um, last week's video there. Um, so today I want to talk about something really simple because I talk about hormones and I talk about hormone testing a lot. So today I want to talk about actually why you would get hormone testing, what hormone testing you would ask for, how you would ask for it, the cost, what, why, in what situation you would use it, and when they're handy. Um, so the, there are different hormone tests and it can be super confusing because you might go to your GP or you might go to a practitioner or you might see someone talk about things online and wonder which is best for you. So they all have got their good points. They're all relevant for certain situations. And so today I'm just going to talk to you about this. But what it's good to remember is the number one thing about understanding your hormones is really to track your symptoms first. And then the testing is kind of the icing on the cake. The reason being is because our hormones can do lots of funky things. Like sometimes we get hormone resistance. So our hormones might come back in super high progesterone, but really that's not equivalent to what's going on our bodies, in our bodies if we're resistant. So get your hormones checked, but know that's the icing on the cake, but always track your symptoms. Track your symptoms through your cycle. When are they better? When are they worse? Simple symptoms like dry eyes, dandruff, smelly breath, um, moodiness, depression, anxiety, heart palpitations, all of these will fluctuate through your cycle. And if you can have a nice track and a log of what's going on, you can actually see not only what is going on with your hormones and which ones might be high or low and how they fluctuate, but also your metabolic hormones, your thyroid, your cortisol. So it's actually, it's actually a good way to check everything. You know, and why, why would you test your hormones? So you want to test your hormones because you might just want to know your ratio, your balance. You might just be interested in knowing what your hormones are doing. You might want to know how your body is reacting to contraception, to the oral contraceptive pill or to the marina. You know, is your body metabolizing the estrogen in the pill? Is your body comfortable with the marina, with the, with the progesterone? What is your liver doing? How is your gallbladder doing? And doing the hormone test will give you a good idea about this function, whether your gut, your liver and your gallbladder are detoxifying these properly through your system. Another is if you've got conditions, if you've got a condition like endometriosis, endometriosis is not just one simple condition that's driven by excess estrogen. It could be driven by excess testosterone. It could be driven by low progesterone. It could be driven by autoimmune, by thyroid conditions. So knowing what your hormones are doing so you know which hormone is driving it for you is super individual. Maybe you've got heavy painful periods, you're suffering anxiety, depression, or maybe you've got no period at all, or maybe ovulation issues, or maybe you're planning to get pregnant. Knowing what your hormones are doing are really important. For example, if you've got low progesterone and you fall pregnant, you're more likely to miscarry. So you want to make sure you've got that nice high progesterone to buffer you. So that's really important as well. Also other things like hair loss, acne, <coughs> a family history of cancer. If you've got a family history of cancer, I'm going to talk about this later, especially estrogen dominant cancers. You want to know what your body is doing to estrogen in your liver, in your gallbladder, and in your gut. So every single hormone can be tested. We can test everything. Things can get tested, but you don't need to test everything. But you know, you can do the estrogen, estradiol, estriol, estrone, testosterone, progesterone. You can do your adrenal hormones, your cortisol and your inactive form, which is cortisone. You can do DHEA to just see how your metabolic hormones are going. You can do your thyroid hormones, prolactin and follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormones. So all of these hormones can be tested. They can be tested for different reasons. They don't necessarily all need to be tested. But your practitioner, you, your GP, whoever it is you're seeing, needs to understand what is the outcome from the test? Why are we testing? And what will the outcome be once we know if it's high or if it's low? We need to know what we're going to do 
There's no point getting tons and tons and tons of tests, but not having a good idea of how you're going to actually action it afterwards. So that's what a good practitioner will be able to do with you. They'll be able to run you through, okay, if this is high, this is what it means, and this is how we're action it. This is why sometimes getting tests with everything on, lots and lots of different tests, can be overwhelming because you never know where to start. So keep it simple. The three main tests that get done, the, the one, the main one is the serum, and that's your blood. And that tests your bound hormones in your blood. Then we've got saliva. Saliva is a sample and it's around five mils. Uh, it's usually done on a certain day of your cycle or it's done th through multiple days. And the saliva actually tests the unbound. So the, the blood is bound. So these are hormones bound to proteins that your body's not utilizing. Saliva tests your unbound which are the active hormones, the hormones that can like activate on tissue. The same with urine. Urine's a little bit different from saliva in so much that the saliva, you're testing kind of what's in the body, the unbound hormone that's activating, but the urine is actually what your body's excreting. So I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, but it's really what's going through your kidneys. What is your body excreting? So sometimes it can be a little bit higher than it is in your body, depending on your detoxification pathways, your methylation, NTHFR, there can be some anomalies. And this is why we go with the symptom picture plus the testing. So with bloods, bloods measure your bound and they're really great for certain things. So for example, they're really great for follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, prolactin, Really great for fasting insulin as well, and also your thyroid hormones, your TSH, T4, T3, and your reverse T3, and your thyroid, um, your thyroid antibodies. Now the problem with the blood is that it's not 100% accurate because it's testing your, your bound. We're not sure what active hormones you do have going on. So you could get the bloods done and they come back okay. Your, estrogen, your GP says your estrogen's in a good place, your progesterone's in a good place, um, but that's not indicative of actually what's just going on in your body. It just gives us that, that really, really small kind of snapshot. So it's not necessarily the best for that, but I'll talk about in a minute what it is good for. Um, so in terms of testing, in terms of testing the luteinizing hormones and when we would use it. So with the blood, the blood is fantastic for doing fertility testing and also some perimenopausal testing. So with follicle stimulating hormone and with luteinizing hormone, you can test them on day five of your cycle if you're looking at your fertility. What that will tell us, that tells us what your luteinizing hormone and your follicle stimulating hormone are doing and if they're in the right range. They're not too high and they're not too low. So for fertility testing, Getting those bloods done on day five if you've been trying to conceive can be quite eye-opening. It can give you an idea of what those hormones are doing. Another test that's actually good for fertility as well, um, and these are low-cost tests, the blood are low-cost because you can get them at your GP, is doing your progesterone on day 21. Now, doing your progesterone via your blood on day 21, it doesn't give you an accurate test in terms of, okay, how much progesterone have you got activating in your body? But what it does gives us a little bit of an insight into is are you ovulating? So the blood is a good test for the, for the day five fertility, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And it's a good quick test to get on day 21 to see is my progesterone rising? Has it risen enough that it means I'm ovulating? And that's, that can be a good sign. And another one is actually getting it done in the early stages of pregnancy. So week five, six and seven, if you've got a history of miscarriage, you can get your progesterone done just to make sure it's climbing nicely. You don't want to wait too long. So if you've had two or more miscarriages, you want to get your blood progesterone done pretty quick. Week five, let's say, as soon as you five out, you're pregnant. Is it rising? And if it's not rising, um, then you can take actions with your GP, but they might do the progesterone pessaries. But it's a really sensible test to do. And even though it doesn't give us an accurate indication of the unbound hormones in the body, it will tell us if your progesterone is at least rising at the rate it should be at the start of pregnancy. Another great test the bloods can do 
is doing that pre-menopause test. So just getting your follicle stimulating hormone tested and your luteinizing hormone. If you're getting that done, you know, you're 45, 50, 55, your periods are starting to drop off, or maybe you're getting some heavy bleeding and you're, everything's going a little bit out of whack. You can actually track your follicle stimulating hormone quite nicely with the blood. And if the follicle stimulating hormone is getting too high, then that can mean that kind of menopausal state. And there's a couple of things you can do. You can actually try to sneakily, if the follicle stimulating hormone is quite high, it means that your progesterone might be low. So you can sneakily try to balance it out yourself for a little bit longer. So you have periods for a little bit longer. I talk about that in my video on Vitex and how to use Chase Tree because that can actually be used to bring follicle stimulating hormone down. This also goes for you ladies that maybe aren't perimenopausal, but it is common for some women to get high follicle stimulating hormone, hot flushes at any age due to stress, due to hormone imbalance. You can use Chase Tree and Vitex just to suppress it a little bit, bring your cycle back nicely. So that's a good way to use that beautiful herb. So that's where I would use bloods. I would use bloods just for those, those are good. Obviously doing other things like vitamin D, but really those are the most important things in, in the bloods. And then of course we've got the non-sex hormones, the metabolic hormones, your TSH, T3 and T4. Um, you can use those, but in terms of sex hormones, follicle stimulating hormones, luteinizing hormones and progesterone to track pregnancy as well. Now, when using um, urine, so urine, it's called the Dutch test. So you may, you may have seen at the Dutch test, it's the um, it's the most expensive. It's kind of the gold standard, and it does a massive array of hormones. It does your inactive, active hormones. You know, it does cortisol, cortisone. It does all your estrogens, all your metabolites, your cortisol metabolites, progesterone metabolites. This is fantastic to see what unbound hormones are being excreted. This gives us an indication of what your hormones are doing in your body. So it's fantastic. And what's beneficial about the Dutch test or testing your hormones in the urine is that it will give us an overview of metabolites. And metabolites are very important when we're looking at things like cancer. So our cancer risk, particularly for ovarian and uterine and breast, if we see certain metabolites that are super high, that gives us an idea that there is a risk factor there. There is high risk and we do need to work on that um, in terms of supporting our liver to excrete the metabolites. So if you've got any history of cancers, any risk factor, any family history of estrogen dominant cancer, getting the metabolites done can be helpful because you can just get in there and you can start working on it nicely and gently yourself. Um, I would I would advise that to anyone who's who's got that you know breast cancer in their family, uterine, ovarian, um, any genetic cancers that are estrogen dominant, I would highly recommend that test at some stage. Um, it can be it can be beneficial just to see that. Now, the downfall um, of the urine is that it measures what we excrete. So what we excrete in our urine has obviously gone through our kidneys, gone through our liver, it's gone into our kidneys, it's gone into our bladder, we've excreted it. So really what it's telling us is what we're excreting. So you may think if we've got more methylation issues, if we're over methylating, if you're doing a cleanse at the time, um, if you've got any issues with um, urinating, so you've got, um, you know, your aldosterone is so high and you're just urinating a lot or you've got kidney issues, then it could come back higher than it really is. But having said that, it won't be a lot higher. It will just be a little bit higher. So bear that in mind if you do get your urine and then you get bloods or you get saliva and there is that discrepancy, the urine's probably most likely to be a little bit higher and that's what your body is excreting. Another thing is the urine does your progesterone metabolites. It doesn't do your actual progesterone hormone itself. So again, that's what you are metabolizing. So it's all about how your body is detoxifying, metabolizing and excreting these hormones. So 
it is very one of the most accurate but it might just be high so if you see it sky 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 high just remember that it's what your body is excreting and then have a think are you doing things like dandelion where your body is urinating more where you're getting rid of more fluid are you detoxing what supplements are you taking if you're taking bees that are speeding up methylation maybe that's speeding up some excretion in the body so there's a couple of things that will just change your results but only ever so slightly the urine is a fantastic one for cortisol. The reason being is you can do, you can kind of do it over a 24 hour cycle. And this is actually how cushions is measured and how we test for cushions. Um, the unbound cortisol is excreted and then that's kind of measured over 24, a 24 hour process. And we can actually see what's happening with the cortisol over that, over that time period. Hormones change, hormones change through the 24 hour cycle. Remember that. So that's why sometimes it's good to get your cortisol done in the morning or the 24 hour cycle. That gives us a real good indication of what's happening. But even your estrogen, your progesterone, they will change through the day as well as the month. So there's always, there's always um, going to be that issue with a few changes. Um, in terms of the next test, saliva test, this is the test I do most frequently. The reason I do this most frequently is sometimes all I want is just uh, kind of like a ballpark. I want to know just simply what the sex hormones are doing, especially if it's not too complex case. We'll just do some simple sex hormones. So with the saliva, we do the saliva. I should mention this with all of the tests. All of the tests when you're measuring sex hormones um, are best done on day 21. So the urine and the saliva are best done on day 21. And I talked about the bloods, day five for follicle stimulating hormone, day, tw day 21 for progesterone. But the saliva is my favorite because one, it's a bit cheaper. Um, two, it, you get your three estrogens, your estrone, your estradiol, and your estriol, testosterone, DHEA, and progesterone. And it just gives me a snapshot. It just gives me a snapshot, an overview of what's happening. And you can just see what you need to tweak. If estrogen is sky high, really, really super high, or there's any history of cancer, then I would advise doing the metabolites or at least working on those estrogens. Now, the, in terms of the restrictions and in terms of the issues with getting the saliva done, there are some. One of the, there's one where if you're using creams, if you're using topical creams, that's going to get into the saliva more. So if you're using creams with progesterone or your estradiol creams, that's probably going to put the results up a little bit further. So it will change your results. Now, another issue is, now this hasn't been proven. This been kind of, has been postulated. It has been postulated that when we get stressed, you know how when you're in your sympathetic and you're stressed, your saliva glands do dry up a little bit and you've got less saliva. There is some postulation that if you're super, super, super highly stressed in sympathetic nervous system, when your cortisol is really high, it's possible that it comes back low because your saliva glands aren't working. Now, this is postulated by um, Dr. Dr. Platt, the Platt Wellness Center. I haven't experienced this. Honestly, when I've had clients with super high cortisol, their cortisol results come back sky high. Um, when I have clients that are really suffering, it feels like fatigue, the cortisol comes back low. So I haven't experienced that, but there is that kind of argument out there. So I would, I would just bear that in mind, testing, and just go with your symptoms. If you get the test back and it doesn't make sense, you can have a think about what might be out or talk to your practitioner, but always go with your symptoms and the test and use them together. Um, so in terms of when you would use these tests, we've talked about the blood. So the blood is best used day five of your cycle for luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Day 21 of your cycle for, for progesterone to test ovulation or in the early stages of pregnancy. And then FSH is a good test to do if you suspect menopausal symptoms or you're getting hot flushes and you just want to see where you are. Um, in terms of getting the saliva, the saliva is good for just kind of that just general, that general kind of hormones. Where are you at? Or maybe you're suffering from endometriosis or maybe you've got polycystic ovarian syndrome and you just want to see what hormone is driving it. Testosterone and estrogen have a funny relationship. And what's interesting, sometimes testosterone will be driving the same things that estrogen could be in some women. So some women have estrogen dominance and that's driving their endometriosis or it's driving their acne. 
Others might be testosterone dominant and that's driving the same thing. So getting a saliva test will just give us that nice kind of like overview of, of your cycle. Now, when you would use a Dutch hormone test, you would use a Dutch hormone test to go a little bit deeper. Um, it goes very deep in terms of the metabolites. It does all the hormones, but it tells us what the metabolites are doing and that's that cancer risk. It also tells us what the cortisol is doing over, over a period, over that 24 hour period. So you're giving various samples, you're doing like a four spot collection. Um, and this is over a 24 hour cycle. So it kind of tells us how the cortisol is running through the day, um, which is really helpful, really, really helpful, particularly if you've got some issues with cortisol, with adrenal fatigue, or you've got some issues with the inactive cortisol or cortisol metabolites. Remember, if estrogen metabolites are driving estrogen dependent cancers, cortisol metabolites can also be um, causing issues as well. So you need to remember that in terms of getting those metabolites done. Sometimes it can be really helpful. So the metabolites kind of tell us, even the cortisol metabolites, they tell us what our body is holding on to. And if there's too, if there's too many being held on to, for example, in clients with really high cortisol metabolites, it means it's been broken down, but the body's not getting rid of it. I see a lot of fogginess, a lot of fatigue, and that kind of fuzzy, fuzzy lack of clarity. Um, and it's really helpful to see all of that because things like licorice um, can really have an influence on your cortisol hormones. And so you just want to be careful with what you're um, what you're taking, herbs you're taking. And this is why the Dutch test or the urine test can help because it will some things that you're taking might not be working for you and might not be suiting you. Now, in terms of cost, now just here in Australia, um, some of these tests are covered by Medicare. For example, at the GP, the blood, the GP at the blood, they can test progesterone. Um, your day 21. So if you're, if you're trying to work on your fertility and you go to your GP, you can ask for follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone in day five. And you can also ask for your progesterone in day 21. Normally that's covered because that's kind of that condition, fertility, trying to conceive. And so that's covered by Medicare. Also, if you feel like you're perimenopausal and you're having severe symptoms, you can also ask for the follicle stimulating hormone. Um, that should be covered. Anything more than that, they can... Um, say that the cost is involved or they won't test because Medicare doesn't cover. But definitely those tests should be covered by Medicare, those simple blood tests that I've talked about. The urine test is the most expensive. It's around $300. You can get that through a practitioner or you can even order it online yourself at the Dutch, Dutch test dot, Dutch dot com. Um, that has three different tests on and you want to get the complete hormone one around $300. Once you get that, they send the pack out to you. You get the results. You will need somebody to go through the results with you because even though they do a lot of um, bump on the back, they talk about what it means, that's not individualized to you. You need somebody who knows your history, has, has a practitioner has gone through everything, and they can kind of put two and two together. It's like solving a puzzle. So even after spending that a couple of hundred dollars on the Dutch test, you will then need to get a practitioner to just help you work through it on what to do next. Um, the saliva test is around $160, and this is you can get this through a naturopath or functional practitioner. The, the urine and the saliva, they're not bulk billed. They're not that you shouldn't, I don't think you'll be getting them back through insurance. So this is an out of pocket expense, but it can be worth it. And this is why we have that kind of saliva versus the urine as well, because the saliva just seems a little bit more affordable, um, a little bit more simple. But if you can and you do have the funds, doing the urine can be quite um, enlightening. It can be very, very helpful if you do want to know your metabolites as well. Um, so just to recap, so in terms of blood, the best time to use get the blood is your day five of your cycle. So when I'm counting day, the days, day one is always the first day of bleeding. And then day five, you just count from day one. FSH, luteinizing hormone. DHEA is a good one to do. And sex hormone binding globulin. That's actually a protein that tells us about your inactive forms, how many proteins are binding to the hormones. It can be quite good, particularly for conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome. Saliva is just good all round general. It's a good one to get to give you a snapshot of what your hormones are doing. Is your progesterone too low? Is your testosterone high? Is there an imbalance with your estrogens? It can give us an idea and then we can start working on that. So you could use it 
for preconception care, you could use it for endometriosis, acne, anxiety, depression, all of those conditions to give you a good snapshot of what your body is doing hormonal wise. And then lastly, the urine is just that more comprehensive. It's going to give you those metabolites, which can be very important, particularly understanding your cancer risk. But also it tells us what your cortisol is doing over the day. It tests your creatine um, and it tests all the estrogen, all the hormone metabolites, the progesterone metabolites. So it gives us a really good overview. Very, very comprehensive. So those are the tests. Um, I did get one question from a lady just asking, how does she ask the doctor for these tests? And doctors work slightly different. So they don't, they don't work in functional medicine. As a functional medicine practitioner or naturopaths, what we do is we like to work at preventing things or we like to work at just making people feel better. Whereas doctors are really working kind of save lives. Is there a disease? Do we need to treat it? How do we treat it? But when you just be honest with your GP, the honesty in terms of how you're feeling. So understand what it is you need in terms of, okay, you, these are the tests you want. So if you think you're, you're perimenopausal, your period's all over the place, you might be concerned. You might be concerned that um, that's happening. You could be concerned because it might lead to osteoporosis. So you want to understand. So you have the right to go to your GP and say, I want to understand what my follicle stimulating hormone is, what my luteinizing hormone is doing, because I want to know, I want to be able to prepare myself in terms of calcium for my body. Do I need to do any um, hormone supplementation? I want to want to prepare. So give them, give them your symptoms, ask them their suggestion for tests, have a look at their suggestion. And if it's missing the ones that you want, you just say, can I have this? Because it will give me a good idea of if I am perimenopausal. The same goes for fertility as well. If you want to get your progesterone tested on day 21, you can say it's worrying you. You've been trying to conceive for a number of months and you would just like to make sure your progesterone's popping up. And the same as when you fall pregnant. If you've had a history of a miscarriage, again, don't be afraid to ask. Tell them why, ask their opinion and for their advice. And then if there's a gap there and it's the testing, you can just then ask for it as well. But always give them a good symptom picture. How are you feeling? And just be honest. And I'm sure the GP will then be more um, happy to give you those tests. But what they won't do is they won't give you the urine Dutch test because that's really an overview of functional medicine. And that's um, kind of different from what they're doing and how they're planning in terms of your health care. So I hope that was helpful. I just wanted to give an overview because I do get asked all the time. And in terms of getting these tests, obviously the bloods you can get from your local GP or through your healthcare practitioner, like a naturopath or holistic GP. Saliva, a naturopath or holistic GP. The urine test you can get through your naturopath or holistic GP. Or you can just order the Dutch test online yourself, but you will need to see somebody to get an overview of the results. I can put the links below as well, especially for the Dutch test. So I hope you found that helpful. Um, let me know if you've got any questions. Please pop any questions below and I will see you this time next week. Bye.